Hello and welcome to the Business Today show. I'm your host Uday Mukherjee. India has a power problem and not of the kind that you've been hearing about in the news over the last few days of the power problems in Delhi. The problem is much bigger. It is that much of India's power is actually dirty. 60% plus of our power comes from fossil fuels, which is coal, lignite, diesel, all the things which are terribly polluting. And only about a quarter comes from renewable sources like wind, like solar, like hydro, which is the kind of power we want. But now, all of India's big industrial groups are getting behind this problem, from the Ambani's to the Adani's to the Tata's. They're all getting into this renewable game. But what made news a few weeks back was that India's first renewable energy company got listed on the Nasdaq. And it was from a relatively younger company called Renew Power. And my guest on the show today is actually a kind of a poster boy of renewable energy from India. Suman Sinha is the founder and chairman and CEO of Renew Power, which got listed on the Nasdaq. Suman, it's very good to have you on the show. Hello, how are you? I'm good, Udayan. Thank you so much for having me on your program. You know, in the Sinha family, which you come from, power means something else. And, you know, your father is Yashwan Sinha, the former finance minister. Your brother, Jayant Sinha, is a prominent member of the current government. But you eschewed that kind of power to get into renewable power. Tell us why. You know, I think the best kind of power there is, is the renewable kind. Um, it, you know, there's, there's so much that you can do. Uh, but let me take a step back. You know, uh, the, the question really is uh, why renewable energy and why am I getting into it? I think the reasons basically are the following that, uh, you know, renewable energy is the need of the hour. Uh, you know, you talked about the fact that India's uh, energy consumption uh, is very heavily skewed towards fossil fuels, which it is. Uh, we all know that. Uh, and that's really dangerous in today's day and age in terms of uh, climate change and pollution. And therefore, uh, there is a very significant need for us to change the energy paradigm in India, certainly, and in elsewhere in the world as well. And we are therefore in the midst of this massive energy transition, where we're moving from fossil fuel-based um, energy systems to clean energy-based energy systems. And uh, not a moment too soon, actually, because uh, of the issues of climate change and so on. And this is a very exciting uh, change that is happening. It's a once-in-a-lifetime kind of change. Uh, that is upon us at this point. And because I was in this sector and I could see it happening, uh, it seemed to me to make eminent sense to, uh, to, um, you know, to devote my career to this sector and really to doing good in a different way, uh, doing good in a way of creating jobs, to clean up the environment, uh, you know, to, to, to provide energy for a growing country like India. I think that, I'm, you know, that's really the path that I embarked on. And uh, as you know, then, there are many ways of doing good, and certainly the way that I have chosen uh, to me seems like a very sensible way of, of getting to that same end out. Well, it's, it's a commendable path, but you're, I mean, investors in India might hold a grouse against you. You know, there are very few renewable energy assets to invest in India, but you chose to go all the way to the NASDAQ to list. Uh, I, I can understand there were good reasons for it, but why not consider an IPO in India and give Indian investors the chance of investing in your company? Yeah, look, Udin, that's a great question, of course. And we considered listing in India very seriously as well. Uh, and keep in mind that our decision was being made somewhere towards the end of last year, almost a year ago, uh, at which time the environment in India was quite different. Um, and uh, so that is one thing, I think. The second thing, of course, is that ESG investing globally has really, really picked up. And... Um, Global investors are looking uh, very seriously at uh, good investment opportunities. And for us, uh, you know, to take uh, the, uh, the Indian opportunity to global investors uh, and to tell them about how rapidly the Indian market was growing, uh, what the opportunities were, what the government's program was to convert the energy system here towards renewable energy, um, and, and to give them the chance of investing in India uh, and to invest in a reasonable sized company like ours it seemed to make a lot of sense. And from our standpoint, what we get is access to a deep liquid pool of investors, which hopefully can uh, help us in the future as well to raise capital, um, which is not to say that we mightn't have had the same opportunity in India, but it is just that to us, uh, global investors seemed uh, more aware of the changing dynamic in the, in the energy industry 
and also with the focus, as I said earlier, on ESG investing, uh, seem to provide a better hmm. uh, receptivity to uh, to a story like ours, which is why we decided to list uh, outside of India. Very quickly, I want to touch upon the route that you took because it was like a merger with a, what we'd like to call a blank check company in RMG, and you got listed through that route. Do you think a lot of Indian unicorns today of, from various sectors now having seen what you've done, might actually explore that route to get listing overseas? Yeah, they could, Odean. There's no reason for them not to. Uh, having said that, you know, markets are volatile. And uh, at a certain point in time uh, in the U.S. market, SPACs were a very attractive way to get to the market. And a number of companies, as you know, took that path, including ours, uh, to become public. Uh, I think today the attractiveness of SPACs uh, has come down. And uh, SPAC, have, SPAC investors have become a lot more selective. And so therefore, they will look carefully at any new investment opportunity. And so therefore, I think whichever Indian company wants to go down that path should obviously examine the market carefully. Now, let's get back to the problem that we started with, which is India's uh, fossil fuel power problem. Now, renewable energy is what? About a quarter of the overall market size now. How soon do you see this transition happening? I mean, how soon can that 60% of dirty power come down to, say, 30 40% and renewable energy get up to 50% plus? How many years will this take, you think? Yeah, you know, first of all, I would hesitate to call it dirty power over there, uh, simply because uh, it's coal-based power. Of course, it, it emits carbon, so to that extent, it's not the cleanest source of energy, but it is the source that has stood India in good stead so far. Um, and India, as you said, still relies on, on that for 60-65% of our total power generation. And that will continue to be the case for some time. Uh, now, today, renewable energy, uh, only wind and solar, accounts for about 10% of, of India's total power generation. If I add hydro, then that, of course, increases to the number that you mentioned, hmm. which is about 25%. But the government has set a fairly ambitious target by 2030 uh, to get the existing installed wind and solar capacity of 100 gigawatts up to about a 450 gigawatts by 2030, which would essentially mean that the 10% of today would become about 30 to 35% by 2030. Now, if I add hydro to the mix at that point, that number will probably go to closer to 50%. But the balance 50% will still continue to come from coal. Um, and and you know, the, the, the reason for that is that India's power demand is going to grow very significantly over the next several years. So even though we're adding tremendous amounts of new capacity on renewables, it you know the power demand is also growing, and therefore the two will in some ways balance each other out. And uh, and so coal will therefore still be there by till about 2030. Now the question is what happens post 2030? After that, I think that renewables will become so much cheaper. Uh, the intermittency issue of renewables will start getting addressed through much cheaper storage, battery solutions, and so on. And Post-2030, I would imagine that we'll start looking at replacing legacy coal assets, which by that time, a lot of them would be nearing the end of their uh, normal life cycle in any case. And so from 2030 to 2040, I would see that that 50% number, including hydro, would probably grow to, grow to 70, 80%, uh, if not more.